Well, welcome. Uh, I'll use my uh, teacher cafeteria voice. Uh, so that's, I'm pretty used to that throughout the week. Anyway, we'd like to welcome you guys uh, to our church. Uh, we thank you that you're here and joining us online. And despite what the weather is saying, the sunshine is holding on for two days, which is magical. We love it. It's a good time. And before I get into my announcements, I have uh, a special announcement from Miss Liz. Yeah, they, we got a new soundboard for y'all, if you didn't know that yet. Um, so they're still figuring out how to tune it and make the microphones work. So I have a teacher voice, but probably not a Josh Heim teacher voice or a, you know, Mrs. Jackson teacher voice. So I'm going to do my best. Okay. In your bulletin, if you notice, there is a blurb about an informative parent meeting coming up next Sunday from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the church in place of normal small groups. So I wanted to let you know what information we're going to be sharing. This is for all parents of kids infant to 12th grade. Uh, if you have a child, or if you're influential in the life of a child, so you've got nieces and nephews or grandchildren, um, what we're going to be talking about are those sensitive topics parents dread. So things like, how do you explain to your kids God's plan for making babies? Can we all go, oh. The hard conversations. How do we protect our kids from predators online? What kind of conversations do we have when your kid is exposed to something that makes them feel dirty and bad? When a kid makes a joke about them on the bus and they don't understand the language being used and now they feel like there's something wrong with them. How do we, how do we prep them for this world that we live in? And there are seven critical conversations that parents need to know how to have with their kids, starting at like two years old and up, how God designed bodies to work, how he meant conversations that we need to be having with our kids, but they're so hard and sometimes embarrassing and sometimes awkward and we don't know exactly what we're supposed to be saying. And so if you are a parent with children, the responsibility for these conversations falls on your shoulders. This isn't something you can farm out to the schools. This isn't something you can expect your youth pastor to handle solely. This is something that you guys really ought to take really the responsibility for these conversations. And so we want to equip you to know how to have these conversations and how to make them God honoring and not not so super awkward that it's just a disaster. And so uh, we're going to be using some stuff we found from Be Broken Ministries. We're going to be watching one of their seminars that they do online specifically about these topics. And then we're going to have a time of discussion afterward. And so at 6 o'clock, we're going to go ahead and have pizza. We have child care for all the kids. And so we're going to have pizza downstairs for the kids, pizza upstairs for the adults, so that we can spend as much time as possible talking about this. Um, if you want to participate, I'd really appreciate it if you let me know so I know how much pizza to order and how many people. So there's a sign-up sheet over here in the Resource Center. Just sign up. Um, like I said, even if you're not a parent but you're influential in the lives of kids, I would love to have you come. Um, or if you're done raising your kids and you have some insights that you feel like would be helpful, we would love to have you there. Um, so that is next Sunday from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the church. Let me know or sign up on the, the sign-up sheet if you'd be interested in coming. Thanks. Okay, cool. I can just talk. I'm loud enough. Thank you guys for not, you know, fully agreeing. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, this is, uh, we got a few announcements, uh, the usual thing. So Sunday night, uh, we have Revive, and then Monday night, we have WCC Kids, and then we have uh, an announcement from Bob and Tara. They would just like to thank everybody for their prayers, their cards, the calls, texts, goodies, all the things uh, during Bob's open heart surgery. Um, everything went smoothly, and the nerves are calm. I mean, that's, that's always the most tense moment, how things are going to play out. And what's just amazing is our church just shows up in droves and rallies. And so they wanted to say thank you, uh, that God is good, and thank you again for the love and kindness uh, from our church family, which is super awesome. Um, so that's, that's, I'm glad to hear that everything went really well. Uh, now, stepping into uh, the time before uh, we worship, um, we try to kind of write our brains, write our spirits about uh, entering into the presence of God. And we've been doing a Bible verse for this entire month. And obviously it's been a little pottery related, no surprise. 
Um, but one thing I kind of wanted to talk about was kiln openings. Like that is Christmas morning in the clay community. Like you get, you put all that labor into it and you just, you know, you offer it up to the kiln, you're like, please come out okay. And then you open it and like I said, it's like Christmas morning. You either get the present that you really, really wanted or it's socks and underwear. So they, you have that. However, every now and then as a maker, you get something out of the kiln and you're like, this one's mine. Like, I'm gonna cherish this. Everything came to fruition. Uh, I labored over this thing. Like, this is gonna be mine. I'm keeping this forever. I made this back in college, which was a long time ago. And so, uh, as soon as I got done throwing it on the wheel, I knew right away I'm keeping this for my person. Um, I have a few others like that. Uh, this is a mug that came out of the kiln recently. And again, it just it came out of the kiln and I, I loved it. I loved the fit of the handle, I loved the blaze. It more than met my needs and then just blew me away as a maker that I get to use this for the purpose that I intended. And I thought through that and I'm going, okay, if I'm getting some if I'm getting excited over something as arbitrary as clay, because it's gonna hold my coffee, how then more does God the Father get excited over his creation, him pouring into us, him molding and shaping us and going, I'm so excited to see this thing to fruition. I can't wait to use it, because it's just gonna, it's just gonna be amazing. It's gonna impact so many people and so many lives. And man, I got goosebumps again writing about this. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's kind of what I wanted to bring this month uh, to a close with, is last week we talked about the low points, the valleys, going through the hard times, feeling like there, there is no end point, the destination. I'm gonna see this through and to completion and then kind of capstoning it with at that completion and then being used by the maker, by the creator. And so the Bible verse uh, that we'll finish off this month with, uh, Philippians 1, 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will see it, well, sorry, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So, there is a Christmas morning, there is a kiln opening, there is amazing intent from God our Father uh, to be used, and I'm excited when those two things line up, when you can almost kind of feel like, ah, that's, that's where... That's where this meets. This gets to be used. And the joy that I had to use the thing I created um, then echoes in how God the Father gets to use us and how he created us and, and wants to use us in, in other people's lives. So before we step into worship, uh, I'll pray. And we'll have about a minute uh, to kind of collect our thoughts. And then the worship team will come up. Father God, I thank you that you are the creator. I thank you that, man, you don't give up on us. Man, we blow it so many times. You just have this drive, this determination to see your creation through to completion, to see uh, your will uh, be into our lives and use us for how you uh, desired and created us to be, Father. We thank you that uh, you don't give up. We thank you that you love us that much and it's so strong, Father. And we ask that we uh, step into that role of being used for how you created. Thank you for this worship team, Father, and thank you for Mickey. We ask all this in your name and pray. Amen.
remember those walls that we called sin and shame. They were like prisons that we couldn't escape. But he came and he died and he rose those walls of rubble now. Remember those giants we called death and grave. They were like mountains that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away.
Jesus, the Son of God, walked along the seashore, and he called men. He walked through the marketplaces, and he called men. He went by a tax collector's booth, and he called men. Many followed him. Twelve consistently were with him, and he taught them for three years. At the end of that three years, it was time. 
He had served as their teacher. He'd served as their brother. He'd served as their Lord and their priest and their king. And now it was time. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying to them, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it, they asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, This, take this, and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Please take the bread. After taking up the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. You may notice that this reads a little differently than what we're used to. And it reads additionally to what we're used to hearing at one time. That's because this is a chronological Bible. And it tells us the things that happen in the order that they happen. And I use this daily in my devotions. One thing that I notice as I read from this rendering of Scripture is that there were many other things that Jesus said after this proclamation of communion in his remembrance. And I would like to read through some of those right now. And as you can see, I'm not reading them all. We would be here for too long. But it is surprising. We think of only the supper, but it was a large teaching opportunity for him at the end of the ministry. And that's something, somewhat what he talks about. One of the things he said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love another, one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and take you to me with me, that you also may be where I am. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be be in you. 
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. All these things I have spoken while still with you. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away, and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Encouragement and prophecy and promises. And there are more. If you read all of the Gospels in this place. The promises are for us. The Holy Spirit. Life with him. And blessings. In our every walk. Let's pray. Father we're thankful for your son Jesus. For our Lord Jesus. For our forgiveness, for our promise of heaven with you and with Jesus, we can't wait to sit at his feet. Help us, Father, through our daily lives, be thinking of all the things that you've done, that you've given to us even being able to be called your sons and daughters because of Christ, your son. Thank you, Father, for the blessings that you continually shower upon us and bless what we bring back to you. And may it be used in a way that will bring more to you, more seeing you as their Lord Savior and God. Forgive us our sin, Father. Help us to strive to do better in every walk in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, it's that time again. Oh, look, the microphone. It works. Kindergarten sixth graders, come on down here. First kid up gets a high five. You want a high five? No? No. Come on down. Excellent. All of our sweet little kids. Uh, Mother's Day is coming right up. It's not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. And we are going to start preparing a fun little thing a little presentation for all the moms and ladies in church, so be looking out for that in a couple of weeks. That's super fun. Kids, why don't you come around here? From about face onward, come in front. Come on. That's right. That way everybody can see you. Okay, we're going to say a quick prayer and then dismiss these kids. Father God, thank you so much for these sweethearts that we have up here. Thank you for parents and for friends and neighbors and grandparents who want to bring kids to church so that they can learn more about you and also learn what it looks like to be in a community of people who love you. God, we ask that you would um, give us wisdom and courage as we go about the, the really 
exciting but difficult job of discipling these kids to learn more and to love you. Thank you so much for this opportunity, and we ask this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. <clears throat> we have several uh, people that we are praying for in our prayers and praises section in our bulletin. And there's one that I would like to highlight. Um, we would like to extend our sympathy to Kim Jordan and her family. Uh, her father, Ken Kwiatkowski, passed away uh, this past week, so just please be in prayer for them. Uh, and just be in prayer for everyone else that is on our list. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this day, and I just thank you that we can all just come together to uh, worship you and praise you, Father God. And I pray right now that you would just be with uh, all of those that are listed on our um, prayer page and our bulletin. I pray that you would just be with those people. Uh, right now, we just lift up uh, Kim Jordan and her family upon the passing of her father. I pray that you would just be with them, uh, wrap your arms around them, Father God, as they go through this difficult time. And I pray that you would be with Mickey as he uh, brings us the message today. Uh, speak through him, Father God, and that I pray that we would uh, hear the words that you want him to speak. And we just thank you for everything. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm just messing with the sound, guys. Um, good morning. How's everybody doing? We got one awesome, one okay. The rest of us still asleep. Um, so this has been kind of a, a different week for me. Um, just it, it's felt very busy and a lot of things going on. And so um, as I was preparing the sermon, it, it was getting done a lot later. And typically I like to, um, you know, tell a story. And, and I was trying to, to figure out a story to, to start us off with and and then I just started to feel really convicted. Um, I started to feel that, that God was uh, telling me this morning specifically, I don't need a story today. You just need me. You need my words. They need to hear my words. They need to hear what's going on. They need to hear who I am. And then I started thinking, you know, a lot of us came in today because this is what we do. On Sundays, we come in and, and we listen to a sermon, we sing songs, and we enjoy a service together. But I, I, I think that a lot of us also came in with some baggage. I think some of us came in today with, with some hurts, some, some sin that's still in our lives, some, some pain that we're dealing with, some struggles, some fears. And I think God wants us to release those. I think God wants us to, to let those go. And, and as, I was, as I was thinking, how, God, what, what way should I start this sermon off? How should I, how should I speak and, and get it? Because I, I want people to see how good you are. I want people to feel how good you are. I want people to understand the comfort that you only give. And he said, bring them in to me. Let's all pray together. Let's all just, let's spend some time praying together and, and really asking God to, to change our hearts, to, to help us with the things we're struggling with, to, to, to get past the sin that we just cannot get rid of. And so that's what I want to do today, because there's an amazing thing in prayer. We get to speak to the creator of the universe and how powerful is it that we can come together as a group of believers and actually go to God and say, God, we need you. And so for the next few minutes, I'm just going to ask that, that we just pray. That whatever's on your heart, whatever's hurting you, maybe, maybe there's something going on in your life. Maybe there's something going on in someone you love's life. And maybe, maybe you're just dealing with something. Maybe you've been afraid. Maybe you're struggling in your job. Maybe you're dealing with stuff in school. Whatever it is, whatever's going on in your life, give it to God. For the next few minutes, let's just give everything to God. And watch what happens. And then I'll... I'll after a few minutes of us praying, I'm going to, I'll lead us in prayer, and then, then we'll get into the scripture. But I just want to encourage you, don't let this just be a, another time where we bow our head and just go, okay, I'm just passing time. Make this a time where it's just you and God only. And whatever is on your heart, whatever God puts on your heart, give it to him. Speak to him. Let's pray.
Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for a day that we can gather as a group of people in your name to worship you. And I pray, Lord, today you speak. I pray, Lord, that, that you take anything that, that I have to say away, Lord, and you speak because people need to hear you. Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to, to dig into your word. Thank you, God, for another day we get to come to you and worship you because you deserve it. Father, I pray for those who are here today that are, that are hurting. I pray, Father, that they can see how good you are and that you can comfort them. And I pray for those that are, that are dealing with sin in their lives, that they're struggling to get rid of. And, Father, I pray today they can break those chains because you are breaking those chains. Father, I, I pray for all those that need to know who you are, that they can see the, the mercy and the grace and the forgiveness and the love that you want to pour out on them. Father, thank you just for being you. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to be going over a story today uh, in the Bible. In John 8, if you have your Bibles, turn to John 8. We're going to go starting in verses 1 and we'll go through 11. A lot of us in here have probably heard this, uh, this part of the Bible, this, this, uh, this story about what happened with Jesus. Um, but I, as I was reading it this, this past week, and I read it multiple times, and I kept going over it, there were just so many things that stuck out. Have you guys ever watched a movie, um, and, and you watch it, and you're like, oh, that was a good movie, and then you watch it again, and something sticks out? And you're like, oh, wow, I never noticed that. And then you watch it again, you're like, oh, I noticed that again. Or you're watching a show, or, or maybe you've heard a story a thousand times, and then finally that, something sticks out and goes, oh, that's what it means. You know, that I think that sometimes we can, we can hear big stories and read big stories in the Bible, right? And some of them have lessons, some of them don't. Some of the lessons uh, that, that are really big that I can think of that we have is, uh, we, we probably have all heard the story of Jonah, Right? Most of us in here, if you've been to a vacation Bible school, you've heard the story of Jonah. And, and Jonah, uh, God tells him to do something, and he doesn't do it. And then all of a sudden, he gets swallowed by a big fish. And then he gets out of the fish, and he goes and does what God does. And this moral of that story is, listen to God, or you'll get swallowed by a fish. That's what I've gotten out of that one every time. Then you have David and Goliath, Right? You, you, you read this story of, of David, this, this young man standing up and, and fighting this big giant. And, and we, we see that he wasn't afraid, and he, he calls him these names, and, and he says, I know who my God is, and my God is bigger than you. And he goes off and he defeats him. And, and we think about the courage and, and having faith in, in, in who God is and, and being able to defeat our giants in life. So we have these stories. But then there are stories when you get in the New Testament, we start kind of rapid firing them off. Because you're reading and you're like, oh, that was neat. Then you go to the next one. And that one's neat. And that you go to the next one. This is one that, that has happened to me. I've read it and I'm like, oh, that, that's neat. But there's so much in it. And so I want to read it, and then we'll start breaking it down a little bit. Starting in verse 1, it says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still, to, still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. This story has a lot in it. And most of us have, have, have read this and, and, and probably have been given a few little things about it. But 
But first, I, I, well, something that I never really thought of, because we always hear, we see that, that this woman was brought in front of, uh, front of this group. And for some reason this time, I, I thought, what would this, I want to put myself in this situation. I want to understand what it would be like. And I'd like to invite you to do the same. Imagine this woman is your sister, your mother. Maybe you're someone who's really close with you. Or imagine she's you. You're in your room living your life, and all of a sudden you, your, your door gets knocked down, and, and these, these leaders from your church come and grab you, and they start to drag you, and they drag you here in front of everyone. And now you're standing here, and you, you have all this shame, and you, you can't even look up, and every single person in the room is looking at you knowing what's going on. And that's exactly what these teachers had done. They didn't have any, any good good news for her. They didn't, they didn't do this out of love. They didn't have any care for her. This was to humiliate her. This was to ultimately murder her because they, they, wanted, they didn't care so much that all they cared about was trapping Jesus in something that they were willing to use this woman as a pawn. And so they bring her up and, and what they say is they say, okay, teacher, well, the law of Moses says this. Right? A woman caught in adultery, uh, it says that we're to stone her. Now, the trap was if he didn't follow the law, he wasn't following the law of Moses. So then everybody listening to him would be like, well, I mean, he's not even doing what what it says to do in the law. Who is this teacher? But if If he did, then all of the people who had been hearing about this mercy, this love, and now what are they going to do when they see him stoning this woman? So they tried to trap him. So as Jesus kneels down, so he starts to write in the ground, and and they, they continue on. They keep questioning him. Then he says this. He says, let any one of you without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He says, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. So Jesus looks at everybody, and he says, okay. Let, the, let anyone here, anyone who's without sin, be someone who throws the first stone. Now, there's this, there's this beauty in this. Because as you, as you continue to read, it says that this, it says those who heard began to walk away one at a time. It says the older ones first, right? So it started with the older ones. There's a lot of wisdom in that, right? Most of us who have who have gotten a little older and, and more mature, realize the, the, the issues that we have, the sins that we, that we struggle with. And, and it says that they, they start to drop down. And then you see that they walk away. Now, there's something that, that has always stuck out to me. This is that he says, can throw the first stone. So after that first stone is thrown, more stones can be thrown. There was someone there without sin. There was someone there who could have thrown that first stone and started the stoning of this woman. And that was Jesus. Jesus could have said, those without sin can throw the first stone. I got it right here. Who's ready to go? If he would have tossed it, she would have been dead. But it says that the, they start to drop them one at a time as Jesus stood there and they walk away. As they walk away, it says... That it goes the oldest to the first until only Jesus was left with this woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Some of the things that I I feel like we can learn from this, this telling of what happened with Jesus... So in the beginning, it says that, that they bring her in and they say that this is the law. And Jesus basically says, no, like those without sin, you throw the first stone. I think one of the first things that we need to, to figure out in this story is we need to look at ourselves and our sin before we start judging others and their sin. We need to put our own rocks down, right? See, here's the deal. When, when you read in Matthew... Matthew 7, this is Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, 1 through 5. It says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? 
How can you say to your brother, let me take this speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, I want to make something really clear about this. It is not saying that we're not to judge. There are different types of judgment. A lot of people will use this as, you, 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 don't, you can't judge me. The Bible says, do not judge. Yeah, it does say it right here, but it's talking about in the measure of judgment, right? So, so there's a thing called holy judgment, and, 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 and we, we, can, we can go to our, our brothers and our sisters in Christ and hold them accountable. If we know that they're doing something against God, we, we can go and say, look, this is not the way you should be living your life. Like, things have to change, right? But what, what Jesus is saying here, he says, do not judge or you too will be judged, for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you used, it will be measured to you. Basically, don't be a hypocrite. Who are you to go and, and throw stones at somebody else when stones can be thrown right back at you? God wants us to love people and to show people mercy and grace. And he, he uses this, Jesus uses this thing of why would you take the speck of salt aside your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own? What does he say to do? First, remove that plank out of yours so then you can see the sawdust clearly. See, Far too often, we're ready to jump down people's throats because we don't think they're doing what they should be doing while ignoring the sin in our own lives. God is calling us to a higher standard than that. God wants us to be better than that, and Jesus is saying that, and, and that's what Jesus is saying to these people. Those of you who haven't messed up, you, you go ahead and throw the stone. Go ahead. So I think the first thing we need to do is, is start to understand that we need mercy and so do they. So as much as we need mercy and we need grace and we need forgiveness, so do they and we need to give it to them too. It doesn't mean saying that the sin is okay. What it means is calling out the sin but doing it in a loving way and treating people with the respect that we want ourselves. Number two, there's something that's really cool to me in this verse. It says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Something that's really powerful in this is Jesus does not condemn her. Here's this woman who was caught in adultery. Something that, that in the law would have been, you would have been stoned, obviously. She should have been put to death by law. But Jesus says, I don't condemn you. And if you go through the Bible and, and what Jesus talks about, and, and most of us in here have heard John 3.16, right? Most of us can quote it. As soon as I said it, we can quote it. Some of us picture people holding it up at football games, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever should believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. What most of us don't know is the verse right after. And that verse says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. So Jesus is saying, I don't condemn you. I'm not here to condemn you right now. I'm here to save you. And then we know he dies on the cross. He gave up his life, took on our sin. And then Romans 8, 1 actually says, therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is a beautiful thing, the sin that, that we're struggling and we're not trying to get rid of and that, that, that keeps on haunting us and bringing it back. Jesus is saying, there's no condemnation if you're in me. There's no condemnation. And so there's this beauty in this story. We have Jesus telling, telling this, this woman or telling everybody, you need to look at yourself. You need to put down the rocks. We need to focus on what's going on in our own lives and how we can fix those to show who God is. And then Jesus doesn't even condemn this woman who by law deserved to be condemned. Then he goes on at the very end, which is my favorite part of this whole thing. It says, neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared, now go and leave your life of sin. See, here's the thing. Jesus didn't condemn her, but he called her to, to live a different lifestyle. He called her to turn away from the sin and be different. And as believers, this is what we're called to do. We are called to turn away and, and, 
and the way that, that I love it being described is when, when Jesus calls us and we repent and we accept Christ, we become holy. The Bible calls us a holy nation, a, a royal priesthood, right? And in and, and 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, it says, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. How do you become holy? It's only through Christ. But see, here's the thing. is far too often as believers... We have allowed this, well, well God's going to change me and God's going to, and he will. That's what happens. But there is also an active step that we take to say, I am not going to fall for the sins that Satan puts, us, puts me in again. When temptation comes, God says, I'm giving you a way out. And we need to take that way out. He calls us to live a different way. See, here's the problem. is so often we say, well, God gives me grace. Well, Paul goes on and says, yeah, so because of that grace, should we keep on sinning? Absolutely not. We're going to turn away from that. You have been called to live a different life. Every single one of us in here has been called to live a different life. Why? Because we have a God who loved us so much that he did give his son to die on a cross for you. And Jesus loves you. And he says that if you're in me, there is no condemnation. You are washed away. All that sin, all those things are gone. But be holy because when people see that you're holy, they're going to see how holy Jesus is. When people see that your life has changed, they're going to want to be a part of that. There's beauty in this story. There's beauty in what Jesus does here. Because the law said it was okay. The law said that if he just goes, you know what, you're right. She deserves to be stoned. Go ahead. Nothing would have happened. But Jesus came and he changed everything. Because I think of all the sin and all the mess ups and all the things I've done throughout my life. And I deserve the cross. I deserve being stoned in front of my peers. I deserve all of that. There's no condemnation anymore. Because God said, I love you. I love you so much that I'm going to send my son to die for you. So as we, as we read these stories, I want to encourage you, as you read through the Bible, don't just skim through it. Know that God is trying to teach us some, something. God wants to show you something. He wants to show you a better way to live, a better life, a a better way to treat people, a better way to show who he is. God wants us to love the people that everyone else says doesn't deserve love. Jesus, that's exactly who he brought in. That's who he brought in. What does he say? I didn't come for the healthy. I came for the sick, right? Right? That's who we need to be loving and showing and speaking truth. Jesus didn't just let this woman go on and say, you know what? I know you've been living this life of adultery. I know it. Go and keep doing what you're doing. I love you anyways. In the end, he says, go and sin no more. And that's what we've been called to preach to people. But God loves you so much and he doesn't want the sin in your life. He doesn't want these things holding on and gripping you and these chains holding you down and this bondage holding you down anymore. He wants to free you from all of that. That's the beauty of the gospel. I don't know where you stand today. I don't. I don't know if you've had an issue with with always projecting our frustrations on others and maybe judging people and, and knowing we, sh- we deserve that same judgment. I don't know if you're dealing with that. Maybe you, you've been called a judgmental person, but God is calling us to stop. Maybe you feel like, like your sin is just too much and that, that you're not good enough and you'll never be good enough and, and God will, will never be able to reach you. Well, God is saying, I, di- I didn't come here to condemn you. I came to save you. And he says that if you are in me, you, there is no condemnation anymore. And so God is calling you to let that go. Because the devil's not going to stop reminding you of your sin. But Jesus isn't going to stop giving you grace, mercy, and love. And you need to remind the devil absolutely every time that there is no condemnation in me anymore. Because I know who my God is. And in the end... God is calling us to be different. 
He's calling us, each and every one of us, to be different, to live a life that's different and separate from everyone else. And the only way we do that is through him and in him, digging in his word, getting to know him and changing, letting him change our heart and saying, God, I don't want to mess up anymore. You can have all the sin. I want to be holy. You can, you can, you can change. If, if I got to give whatever I have to give up to follow you better, I want to do it. That's what we've been called to do. So I just want to encourage you today. You are loved. You are absolutely loved. The person next to you, God loves them too. Your neighbor, God loves them. The person that that you're frustrated with right now, God loves them. All the people that are shouting and screaming on TV, God loves them too. All the people that, that you just get frustrated with, God loves them too. And God has called us to share his good news with them. I can't imagine what it would be like if someone didn't step out of their comfort zone and share the gospel message with a young punk kid that wanted nothing to do with God. I don't know where I'd be, but somebody saw somebody who needed to hear the gospel and loved me. And now God has absolutely changed everything in my life. And I have the honor and the pleasure to stand up here because somebody decided to show me the love of Christ when I didn't deserve it. And I think God is calling each and every one of us to do that. Maybe you feel like you don't deserve it. Do you understand how much God loves you? And I pray that that's what you leave here with today. As you are, you are wonderfully and perfectly made in his image. And he just wants you to, to just come into, into him and, and, and say, God, I need you. Because that's how amazing he is. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for for showing us the way we're supposed to treat others, showing us the way you treat us when we don't deserve to be treated that way. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you change our hearts. For some of us that that struggle and get angry and, and just want to hold on to things, I pray that we let them go. I pray, Lord, that we can treat others the way you treat us each and every day. I pray, Lord, that we can speak truth to those who need to hear truth. Because that's exactly what you did in this situation. You spoke truth. And Father, I pray that we can follow that example. But we can do it in a loving way that they can come to see you. Because you are mercy and grace and love. Thank you, Father, for showing us all of that. God, may we leave here today understanding you a little bit better. And Father, I pray for those who haven't felt your love or don't know you or are struggling to feel it, Father, shower them with love today. Shower them with your comfort. Shower them with your grace. Father, those that have been struggling with sin, I I pray, Lord, you break the chains. You are good. May our worship be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name.
Thank you for joining us this morning and have a wonderful Sunday.